Hello everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilovepathology.com. The topic which I am discussing today is clinical manifestations of cancer. So let us understand this under these various headings. One, effects of uh, neoplasia on patients in terms of local and hormonal effects. We will discuss briefly about cancer cachexia and then we'll discuss in detail about paraneoplastic syndromes. Firstly, effects of neoplasm on the patients. See, both benign tumors as well as malignant tumors can have effects, both local effects as well as hormonal effects. So, let us see one by one. What is this local effects? See, the location of the tumor is very important and critical determinant when we talk about local effects because, you know, these tumors may encroach upon essential tissues and hinder their function. Secondly, these tumors can also result in tissue death and provide as an entry point for infection. Okay, let us see these under a uh, few examples. One, a very small pituitary adenoma, you know, because it is situated in such a place, even a small adenoma, even a minor enlargement can compress the normal surrounding tissue and can result in serious hypopituitarism, right? See, tumors of gastrointestinal tract, you know, they can cause obstruction as they enlarge and they also can cause ulceration, secondary infections and bleeding. And neoplasms of urinary tract, you know, also similarly, uh, just like what gastrointestinal tract tumors can do, even these tumors can cause obstruction as they enlarge and then they also result in hematuria, that is pass passage of blood in urine. Now, coming on to the hormonal effects, see, usually we talk about hormonal effects when we are discussing tumors of endocrine glands, right? See, among the benign and malignant tumors, it is the benign tumors which actually, you know, they cause increased hormone production. Malignant do not cause uh, increased hormone production because they are most often poorly differentiated and non-functional. And also, these malignant tumors can destroy the normal endocrine uh, gland itself. Okay, that's why malignant tumors do not have a hormone, a increased hormone production, whereas benign tumors have increased hormone production. Even though the tumor is benign, because of increased hormone production, that can have catastrophic consequences. For example, a small tumor, a beta cell adenoma of you know pancreas, though it is less than one centimeter, it can cause significant amount of production of insulin, which can result in fatal hypoglycemia okay so irrespective of whether you're dealing with benign or malignant see in this case it is a benign tumor which can result in death right so that is the effect of neoplasia on patients it does not depend upon whether you're dealing with benign or malignant it depends upon the location it depends upon the hormone it is produced right so that's what we have discussed right now but Apart from the tumors of endocrine glands, you can also, the other tumors, you know, which are non-endocrine can also produce increased hormone, increased hormones, okay? And that can lead to symptoms and these are known as paraneoplastic syndromes. We will discuss in detail about this a bit later now. So, moving on to understanding cancer cachexia. So, what is this? Cancer cachexia is a hyper catabolic state. Now, what do you mean by hypercatabolic state? It means there is increased metabolism of, you know, normal constituents of the body, thereby resulting in loss of muscle mass. And this loss of muscle mass can be with or without loss of fat. Okay. And this loss of muscle mass is cannot, cannot be explained by diminished food intake. That's what is cancer cachexia. Usually occurs in around 50% of cancer patients and the most common associated cancers are advanced gastrointestinal tract cancers, advanced pancreatic cancers and advanced lung cancers. Of course, you can find cachexia in almost all cancers, but most often these are found in these advanced cancers. How do they manifest? They manifest with extreme weight loss, fatigue, muscle atrophy, as I mentioned, anemia, anorexia, and generalized edema. You know, the cause of death in these patients, in patients with cancer cachexia, basically is due to respiratory failure because of atrophy of diaphragm and other respiratory muscles. Now, what is the pathogenesis of cancer cachexia? Exactly, you know, the precise cause of cancer cachexia is actually not known, but there are some hypotheses like, you know, the uh, tumor cells will, I mean, they produce tumor necrosis factor, interleukin 1 and interleukin 6, which have a major role. And what do they do? They increase the degradation of myosin heavy chain that you know that it is a skeletal muscle structural protein, right? And because of increased degradation that results in diminished muscle mass. 
tumors. Now, it can also, some tumors can also produce a component called lipid mobilizing factor, which sensitize the adipocytes to lipolytic stimuli. That means, you know, the breakage of the adipocytes, which leads to diminished fat stores. So, these are the uh, probable mechanisms of cancer, cachexia, though we do not know the exact cause. So that's about cancer cachexia. Now moving on to understanding paraneoplastic syndromes. A very important component, very important thing you need to understand in cancers is paraneoplastic syndromes. What are these? These are basically, you know, the signs and symptoms in some patients of cancers which cannot be explained by the anatomic distribution of the tumor or by the elaboration of hormones which are indigenous to the tissue from which the tumor arose. So, let me explain this uh, in simpler terms. See, for example, you have a lung cancer and this lung cancer patient presents with hypercortisolism, which means you, uh, these patients manifest with Cushing syndromes, right? Can you explain? Because it, it hypercortisolism means what? Increased levels of serum cortisone levels. Hmm? That you cannot explain because lung is not the site of production of cortisone, right? And by elaboration of hormones, lung, the normal lung parenchyma does not secrete cortisol, right? So, these are the paraneoplastic syndromes. What I mean to say that these are the signs and symptoms which you cannot explain by the nature of the tumor of that particular organ, right? So, these are paraneoplastic syndromes. Now, why it is important to know about the paraneoplastic syndromes? That's because they may be the first manifestation of an occult tumor, right? So, they can cause significant clinical problems and they may be lethal too. You know, and it can be mistaken for metastatic disease, you know, and therefore it may lead to inappropriate treatment. That's the reason why you need to know about these probable, you know, paraneoplastic syndromes in cancer patients. Sometimes, you know, they may be the first manifestation. Patient might present with Cushing syndrome and you end up finding that this patient, patient might be having a lung cancer. So, how do you classify these paraneoplastic syndromes now? These can be classified based on, you know, whether they are hormonal or something else. So, the most important one are, ones are the endocrinopathies. The second one is neuromyopathic syndromes, the muscle and the nerve uh, syndromes. The third one is the skin manifestations, the dermatologic manifestations. The fourth one is the bone manifestations. And the last one is a vascular or hematologic manifestations. So, let us see uh, Let us see the examples of each one of these first endocrinopathies. Now, some tumors like small cell carcinoma of the lung, the carcinoma of the you know, pancreas and some central nervous system tumors, you know, they secrete adenosine adenocorticotrophic hormone or ACTH like substance that was that was what we were, I was talking right and this will result in a condition called Cushing syndrome and this is the most common paraneoplastic syndrome in among endocrinopathies now some tumors like squamous cell carcinoma of the lung the breast carcinoma and the renal carcinoma they also you know help you know, secrete parathyroid hormone related protein and this results in hypercalcemia so, hypercalcemia can be found in these lung tumors, breast tumors and renal tumors. Some of the renal tumors and, you know, cerebellar hemangioma, some, some of the, this is a benign tumor. They can increase, you know, they can produce increased erythropoietin levels leading to polycythemia. Okay, and some tumors like ovarian carcinomas and fibrosarcomas do produce insulin-like substance or even insulin which can result in hypoglycemia. So, these are the important endocrinopathies, right? Polycythemia, hypoglycemia, hypercalcemia are all endocrinopathies. Now, moving on to neuromyopathic manifestations. Tumors like, you know, bronchogenic carcinoma, I mean, the tumors of the bronchus or the thymic neoplasms, tumors of thymus. The mechanism, what they do is, you know, because of immunologic attack on the normal tissues, it can result in myasthenia-like syndrome or even myasthenia gravis-like disease. Or it can also result in peripheral neuropathies, even encephalitis, cortical cerebellar degeneration and a polymyopathy resulting in polymyositis, resembling polymyositis. So, this is basically because of not elaboration of hormones, but because of immunologic attack on the normal tissues resulting in myasthenia-like syndrome. Now, third one is the dermatologic manifestations. Some carcinomas like carcinomas of the stomach, 
the lung carcinomas and the uterine carcinomas you know again the mechanism is immunologic attack on the skin or secretion of epidermal growth factor so that results in a condition called acanthosis nigricans what does that mean they are basically black patches of thickened hyperkeratotic skin with a velvety appearance this can be seen throughout the body usually in the flexural aspects and this is known as acanthosis nigricans which can be the first manifestation of underlying cancer like gastric carcinoma lung carcinoma and uterine carcinomas moving on to osseous manifestations cars well, tumors like bronchogenic carcinoma and again thymic neoplasms sometimes you know you find in these tumors the periosteal newborn formation can be observed primarily at the distal end of long bones or the metatarsals metacarpals and proximal phalanges note that there is periosteal newborn formation or it can all they can also present with you know arthritis of the adjacent joints where there is periosteal newborn formation they can even manifest with clubbing of digits so these are paraneoplastic syndromes which is known as hypertrophic osteoarthropathy hypertrophic osteoarthropathy is a osseous manifestation which is one of the paraneoplastic syndromes in these malignancies the mechanism of this is actually not known So the last one vascular or hematologic manifestations tumors like pancreatic carcinoma or bronchogenic carcinoma you know they produce the tumor product itself or the mucins you know they activate clotting which can result in extensive thrombosis extensive venous thrombosis and the feature of this thrombosis is you know uh, at one point of time you, you find thrombosis in one area and then at the next moment or even after few hours you find thrombosis elsewhere so that's why this is also referred to as migratory thrombophlebitis or trosseo phenomenon okay that's because of the mucins which activate clotting or the tumor products second one like uh, malignancy is like acute promyelocytic leukemia or prostatic carcinomas again because of the tumor products which activate clotting can result in disseminated intravascular coagulation patient might present with dicr disseminated intravascular coagulation sometimes advanced mucin secreting adenocarcinomas particularly of the git you know they also result in hypercoagulability lead into you know small non bacterial vegetations they are basically bland non infective vegetations sometimes form on the cardiac valve leaflets and these are known as non bacterial and because of because these are thrombotic they are also called as thrombotic non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis okay in advanced mucin secreting adenocarcinomas so let's uh, quickly uh, summarize the various paraneoplastic syndromes we talked about endocrinopathies being cushing's hypercalcemia polycythemia and hypoglycemia neuromyopathic syndromes myasthenia and other uh, you know um, uh, symptoms like peripheral neuropathies and polymyositis dermatologic manifestations acanthosis nigricans hypertrophic osteoarthropathy as an osteo osseous manifestation and we saw that it could be a venous thrombosis which is basically migrate to thrombophlebitis or non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis or dic as vascular and hematologic manifestations so now you need to understand that these are the various para neoplastic syndromes so that completes today's topic we did discuss in brief about the local and hormonal effects on uh, the patients of these cancers we talked about cancer cachexia and in detail about paraneoplastic syndromes thank you for watching if you have liked this video hit the like button do comment don't forget to subscribe if you have liked this video and do share thank you